Welcome into Locked On Reds and Locked On Rays. As we are here for a crossover, the Reds and Rays just got done with a series in which the Rays took two out of three, and we saw the dominance that the Rays have really posed in this early portion of the 2023 season in games two and three. We are going to get to our big thoughts from this series, a couple of players that really impressed us, and how the Reds and Rays move forward as we go through this season. But hey, I want to introduce myself. I am Jeff Carr, host, co-host, one part of the Locked On Reds podcast. And joined with me are Ulysses Sambrano and Kevin Weiss from Locked On Rays as we take a look at a series that doesn't happen very often. Guys, this, this was something that, and I know that uh, you had dropped the stat that the the Rays are something like, at least until game two, they were like two and seven in the city of Cincinnati and now they're four and seven, but it's just crazy to think that in the years uh, that well, we have watched baseball, the Reds and Rays don't really lock horns too much. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I think last year it was such a weird series between these two teams because, first of all, the Reds swept uh, the the Rays. Yeah. The Rays lose Franco to a Jaime bone fracture. They lose Shane Boss to a Tommy John, and they lose two out of three games on walk offs, and one of them by a balk off, which I had <laughs> never seen in my life of almost twenty five years of watching professional baseball. So yeah, yeah, they don't meet a lot, but from those two last series, those last six games that they've played, you see some wacky stuff between these two teams for sure. Yeah, and, and let me just add to that. It's nice to have more interleague play and more balanced scheduling where we get to see teams like the Reds more often. I just think that's great for baseball, just being exposed to different franchises, different cities, different ballparks, different organizations, and, and learning more about the game and the other players that are out there. We seem to sometimes be too siloed off with what the Rays are doing and what uh, the AL East is doing, but getting more of a taste of the NL Central and the NL East and the NL West, I think, is only a great thing for baseball as well. Yeah, there's only so many times you can see the Yankees, right? right. right. <laughs> there, there's only so many times we can see the Pirates, by the way. We're seeing them this weekend. But mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's it's nice to to get to see some different teams that the Reds just don't get a chance to play quite a bit. And, and I'm happy with that. And I think that, you know, that's going to be part of the larger discussion about, you know, expansion, and they're going to reorganize everything here in the next couple of years. But I, obviously, that's another podcast looking at these three games. I mean, obviously, the biggest thing for me was just seeing that dominance. And I know that they tripped up in game one, I know that the Reds were able to get over on game one and really just put a crooked number on the scoreboard. But the way that the Rays bounce back in that just shows the quality that they have been showing all all this like first early portion of the season. And I know, you know, everybody's favorite thing is, do we really know anything about anything in baseball before Memorial Day? I know this, the Rays are going to be at the top of the AL East all season long. Ooh, I like that. I like that. I'll take that good vibe over to Tampa Bay, Jeff, because <laughs> that would be a very nice thing to to see this season. Uh, if I had to, you know, pick one word from this series, it'd be surprising. It's surprising mm -hmm. because, you know, the first game was surprising. I mean, the Reds came out hot. They put a lot of, sco uh, of scoring against the, the Rays pitching that, you know, the fielding looked kind of off. The bats were flat for, from the Rays. So that that was surprising to see. But it was surprising to see this, the next two games because Lodolo, who was amazing uh, un until that game, kind of didn't have it that day. And then the Rays just kept on, on putting numbers up on Tuesday and on Wednesday afternoon as well. So if I had to take one word is that this, this, this series really was surprising to me. Yeah, that was something that I, I was curious about on the Lodolo start because it was something that Hunter Green said after his first outing or after the game that he left early, he was still saying like through those three innings, he noticed that Rays hitters don't get cheated. Rays hitters are very smart about the strike zone. They really make you work it. And when I saw that matchup with Nick Lodolo, Nick Lodolo's bread and butter is that low and inside curveball. And just the way that the lineup was able to lay off of that, force him to move that curveball just a little bit closer to the plate. And you saw what happened whenever he tried to move it just a little bit, he ended up putting it right down the middle and, and guys were absolutely clobbering him. That was the worst start of his career. And, and, and really kind of when I, when I watched that game, Kevin, there, that was the main thing that I took away from that was just the rays were just all over him. And that was a game that where the reds could do no wrong in game one, they couldn't do anything right in game two. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's it's really funny because coming into that game, I was a little bit concerned about, hey, are the Rays going to struggle offensively against Nick Lodolo because I saw highlights and saw the stats, and I was like, this guy's a really good starter. He might be able to keep it up and run one against the Rays, and that's kind of been a theme for the Rays so far this season is um, just a, a better understanding of the strike zone, better discipline, finding your pitch to hit, finding a pitch that is a strike and driving it. And guys are doing an absolutely tremendous job at driving those pitches that they can handle. And, um, you know, one of the big storylines coming into the season was Randy Rosarina and other guys as well of not getting cheated and not getting fooled with a, a pitch that's outside the zone or going and chasing a pitch outside the zone. And I think where, you know, whether it's a combination of the, uh, the hitting coach, Chad Matola and, and some, um, some better messaging from the front office and the coaching staff to the players of like, here, hey, this is what uh, teams are doing and, and this is where you're getting fooled. Don't get fooled. So um, that that's a great thing. And, I, and, and, and another big theme and takeaway too is just you have pretty much the entirety of the lineup healthy. We couldn't say that last season. And when you add a, a guy of, of Yandy Diaz caliber and – and Wander Franco's caliber and other guys' caliber into the into the lineup, it just makes it that much stronger. And you look up and down and you say, "Man, these guys really know what they're doing at the plate." Yeah, really. When I I looked at the middle of that order, there were and it was in game one. The Reds were only up four nothing going into I think it was the seventh inning. It was either yeah, it was the bottom of the seventh inning. And I was looking at this. I'm like, okay, when we come back to the bottom of the eighth, they got the middle of the order up. Is this something that we got to have Alexis Diaz on standby maybe to get six outs here because you cannot miss versus the middle of this lineup? And then they were just able to blow the doors off in the bottom of the seventh. But that that's that's a middle of the lineup, Ulysses, that I think that the reason why I say I'm confident that the Rays are going to be up there all year is because that middle of the lineup is going to play with anybody that's on the mound from any other team, whether it's Garrett Cole, whether it's Chris Sale, you know, whoever, whoever's on the other side of the the mound yeah and what's better uh, uh, about it this season like kevin mentioned yeah the health is there but also they're so friendly with matchups it doesn't really matter if it's a lefty on the mound you've got the switch hitters and the righties to take care of that and if it's a righty on the mound you've got the same thing on the left side it's it's really cool how that is an option actually many options kevin cash has th this season to just kind of play around with the with the lineups and everybody has been on fire except for maybe manuel margot who's still kind of finding mm -hmm. his his groove everybody's hitting the ball i mean you've got luke Rayleigh, josh Lode, harold ramirez who are surprises beth and court mejia doing their thing behind the the backstop but it like you mentioned that middle of the order randy rosarena from the world baseball classic to the pose to everything else he is killing it then you go to yandy ds who apparently apparently has fixed that mythical launch angle issue that he's had because with that body you're thinking 70 home runs every five games and he's never done that and now he's actually has five home runs in what 17 games his career high is 14 his K to, uh, K to walk ratio has been impeccable all his career long. And now this year, it's basically one-to-one. -one. And he has more power. So this guy could possibly have a five-war season when last year he had at a 3.8. So that middle of the order is scary good. And if you add a Brandon Lau who's healthy, who can give you 40 bombs, and you can add a Wander Franco who's supposed to be the next big thing in baseball, then yeah, the Rays lineup does look like a wagon. Yeah, I feel like, Yandy Diaz maybe saw like five pitches from Nick Lodolo and got like four hits off of him. Like he was just seeing him super well yeah. <laughs> in that game. Uh, and, and conversely, something I've talked about and Steve and I have talked about a lot on the show is that this Reds lineup is going to keep them in every game. And they were just completely shut down. And it really started with Jonathan India. India did not have a hit in this series. He did still get on base a couple of times via the walk, but he saw his batting average creep below 300. There were a couple of guys that were just on torrid starts that have really cooled off here recently. Jake Fraley's another guy that I look at that I was I was hoping to see, you know, maybe him kind of bounce back a little bit. And you guys didn't get the chance to see Spencer Steer, so I'm, I'm kind of hoping that there's nothing more there. I think the reports were that he is not experiencing any pain. He had a sore knee, and they were, you know, trying to be cautious with him, not put him on the IL, but also not – play him for a few days so hopefully we'll see him back in this Pittsburgh series but 
all in all, just the, the way that this series kind of went was so strange to me because there really weren't any games where it was like one side was playing and the other side just decided not yeah. to. It was kind of strange. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and what's interesting too is, and again, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I looked at the Reds and, and they had been scoring runs leading into the series, but I look up and down the lineup and I'm looking at the middle of the order and I'm just saying – does that really strike fear into an opposing team and to an opposing pitching staff where you have, you know, Fraley and, and Newman and like, it's, it's, it doesn't, it's, it, it makes it to where if you're the Rays, you're confident enough to, okay, we'll roll out Taj Bradley, a rookie. And, and we have confidence that in his second start, he'll be able to hold his own and not just hold his own, but dominate as well. Like there's not, um, more of a picture perfect opportunity for a guy like that a- outside of starting at home, but you're facing a a Reds team that's struggling and quite frankly going nowhere. A lineup that is devoid of huge superstar names, and at a ballpark where you know the crowd is kind of dead. At least that's what it seemed like. No, no, and I mean, heck, they had the lowest crowd I think ever for a Great American Ballpark in Game One. Part of that was weather and things like that yeah but, i mean seven thousand, and that and i knew some folks that were down there and they were just like that was the reported total it felt like there was even far less <laughs> wow. uh, folks that were actually at the stadium there so you know who really knows on that on that avenue but I, I think that the team itself doesn't necessarily have anybody that strikes fear yet there's some guys that are getting there and there's some guys that will come up uh, at some point this season like Ellie De La Cruz that will begin to build that profile but you're absolutely right I mean on paper at the moment the Reds aren't striking fear in anybody and the Red or the Rays pitching staff rose to the occasion in games two and three which is a bit of a tease for something I want to look at here because there was a guy that absolutely impressed me on this Rays pitching staff and he's a former division at least prospect I can't remember if he pitched it all for the Brewers but we've seen him we saw him for a minute before he went down to Tampa Bay. We're going to talk about who that is coming up in just a moment. Before we get into that, though, I want to tell you guys about our sponsor, and that is Built Bar. You know, something exciting is coming to Built.com on April 22nd. I don't have all the details yet, but the excitement is real, and it's something you won't want to miss. If you know how Built works, they have the most incredible protein bars in the world, and they do these amazing flavor drops with unreal flavors in limited quantity. I know for me, I'm all about the cookie dough chunk puff. I don't know how you put cookie dough chunks in a marshmallow and and add protein into it, but it's it's absolutely phenomenal, guys. Like I don't know, what's your guys' favorite flavors? Brownie batter, hands down. I'm a brownie guy. Yeah, that's that's that. got to be mine. What about you? Uh, I, I could do a little cookies and cream, but sometimes I just reach in the box and I do a, you know, surprise me, mystery, mystery pick. That's what I go with. <laughs> and see, the best thing about that is whatever you grab, it's got amazing macros. It's got amazing numbers and it's not going to kill you on the calories either. So mark your calendars and head to built.com on Saturday, April 22nd to be one of the first to discover what all the hype is about. I can't wait to see what this new flavor is. I don't know what it is, but I'm looking forward to seeing it and make sure you use the promo code locked on 15 at checkout and you'll get 15% off your order. That's built.com on April 22nd. All right, guys. So with this series wrapping up here in Cincinnati, uh, Rays take two out of three. And by the way, you can catch Rays baseball. You can catch Reds baseball on Sirius XM on the SXM app. You just search Reds or Rays. Uh, any day that they're on there, by the way, Sirius always has those play by play broadcasts. But um, as we look back at this series and I'm going to go ahead and tip my hand here because I teased it. Uh, Drew Rasmussen absolutely impressed me. Like when I saw that he was on the bill to start in game three, I was like, I know this guy's got a lot of talent and I know he's had a really nice start to the season, but let's see what he's got because maybe the, the, the gritty at bats, the long at bats that reds, hitters have been trying to do uh, is going to, is going to mess him up. That wasn't the case at all. In fact, I think there was a stretch there from the, th- from the end of the second through like the fourth or something like that, where he struck out like six of seven. And it was just absolutely phenomenal how he moved through this order. I, I'm not going to make any excuses for anybody because I thought that this was a case where the reds lineup 
just got outpitched and, and, and was completely beat up on a Drew Rasmussen. He's been able to attack the zone, which is, you know, kind of maybe contradictory to the fact that he did have three walks uh, true, true. today, but that's what he's known for, for attacking the zone. And uh, for me personally, I, you know, you always have a, a favorite player, maybe a favorite pitcher, a favorite hitter, and they don't necessarily have to be like the best player on that team or the best pitcher of that staff. Right. Mine's Drew Rasmus, and I just like the bulldog mentality. It kind of takes me back to Alex Cobb, uh, you know, in 2014, uh, yeah. 2013. It takes me back to James Shields, 2008, 2009. Like, that's the kind of vibe that Drew Rasmussen gives me. And I love that about a pitcher, just a dude. Like when you see his demeanor, when you see his body language, it just means I don't care who you are. I'm going after you. And you just got to love that from a starting pitcher. And like, yeah, like you said, he he does have strikeout stuff. Um, you know, the walks, I think he, it's something that he'll have to um, get better because the last two starts have been a little bit off on that metric. But I've been really impressed with well with the, the whole rotation. But yeah, Drew Rasmussen is definitely you're, you're not going to hear any negatives from me when when you talk about Drew Rasmussen. Yeah, that and and it's something that made me wonder because as he was pitching, I was reminded of how he ended up down in Tampa Bay, and obviously, I think from the Rays' perspective, and maybe you guys can correct me on this, but if you were to revisit that trade. Would you redo that trade at all? Or from the Rays' perspective, is it a no-brainer? I would think it was a no-brainer because you had Wander Franco on the come-up, and I think the Rays had ideas and ideations about what they could do with Drew Rasmussen and the other piece of that deal, J.P. Fireisen, didn't necessarily work all out all that well with fire eyes and as he's no longer on the team but i think that they saw the potential to convert and transfer drew rasmussen into a starter just like they did with jeffrey springs before he unfortunately has gone down with an injury and it, it's just a testament to what the rays do with their pitching staff and and what they've got going on in the lab because nobody i i mean not to toot my own horn ulysses but i was one of the first ones saying you know, maybe the Rays should try out Drew Rasmussen as a starter. He was only a two-pitch pitcher at the time, but I think the Rays were kind of in a little bit of desperation mode and, and trying something new, and it kind of worked out. And now you look, he's got like four or five different pitches, and, and he definitely looks the part, acts the part, and, and is performing great. Um, and if you look at his career numbers, I mean, they're, they're as fantastic as could be. I'm a little bit not concerned, but I have I, – I pose a little bit of caution because – he worked the most innings he's ever worked before this past year. And I just wonder if he's going to be able to keep it up for the entirety of this season. And there's a lot of onus on him with the injuries to Zach Eflin, with the injuries to Tyler glass now, and, and now springs out for out for the count. But um, no, I think it was, it was a, a great trade. It worked out for both sides, a, a win, win. Um, so I've got really no complaints on that end. You can never have enough pitching as the Rays are quickly learning and how every team in baseball learns at some point and, and just to add to that i know a lot of people might say oh well willie adamas has been killing in the brewers are you kidding me the race should really be using that offense production just look at the splits of willie yeah. adamas away from the trop and at the trop and you can tell you can't carry a guy who doesn't see the ball at the trop i mean yeah. the numbers were just com it was player you know um, dr hyde and mr jekyll or whatever the the yeah. the, the suffix is there you know, it, it's, it was just night and day for Willie yeah. Adamas. So, yeah, it, I think, like Kevin said, it's a win-win for both teams. Yeah, and just to add to that, it, it was like we – and and it's still kind of a mystery as to why Willie Adamas struggled so much at the trop. It could be the lighting and how that affected his vision, or maybe it was more so a thing of he just struggled so much, it got too much into his head, and he was mm. never going to get out of it one way or the other. And even though he brought yeah. so much in the leadership department and and bringing so much uh, energy to the clubhouse, not to mention what he did defensively and at times offensively, mostly on the road, I think it was time that, okay, you had Taylor Walls bubbling up in the minors. Because let's remember, he was the first call-up before Wander got called up. Um, and you just had a really a glut of middle infielders. You still do have a glut of middle infielders. And um, I think that it was, uh, you know, the, the timing worked out for, for the Rays. And again, both sides, I, I think both sides are, are really, really uh, happy with, with how it made out. 
I uh, the dominance that Drew Rasmussen had there in that third game, Ras, Rasmussen had in that third game, and just the the fact that you trade Willie Adamas, and it's like, well, you have the best prospect in baseball that he's mm-hmm. blocking right now. It's like, yeah, I I think it is kind of a no brainer. I was wondering of from the Brewers' perspective too, and I'm just like, because I I'm not sure if they're gonna re-sign him. I'm not sure if they're gonna commit to him especially depending on how they do this year. Obviously right now they're doing fine early on right, the season. Yeah. They're in first. Um, but as, as the season moves along, uh, Corbin Burns just had an injury scare. What's that going to look like? They've already kind of made him mad through the arbitration process. Mm-hmm. So if Corbin Burns isn't there, then should Brandon Woodruff be there? And then all this other stuff. Like, I feel like there's going to be a very weird feeling to the brewers if they start to come back down to earth, like I kind of thought they were, I didn't necessarily think the Brewers were going to contend for this division this year. So I'm kind of surprised at where they are currently, but again, Mm -hmm. like we said, it's early on. Um, I will say this early on, we've seen performances from the Rays, obviously that are historic and awesome. And we've seen performances from the Reds that I think have inspired not only optimistic crazy people like myself but also normal reds fans as well and we're going to talk about what uh what both of our teams look like moving forward and what they need to do to achieve their goals this season absolutely and for a championship team like the rays and maybe eventually the reds it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit it's the same When it comes to your vehicle, every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head over to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to My Garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, Confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's so easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. This is the Locked On Reds, Locked On Rays crossover, and we are kind of recapping the series and, and looking forward now. And by the way, as we look forward each and every day, you can listen to Rays and Reds broadcasts on Sirius XM, download the SXM app, and search Rays and Reds. And when it comes to the Rays coming into this season, obviously these first 20 games or so have you guys feeling very, very good about everything. Uh, when you were coming into opening day, what were your aspirations for this season? Uh, good question because we, we did have a preseason, you know, what could happen episode and, you know, Kevin and I differ, uh, on, on, on that. end. I, I looked at it as a 93 win mm-hmm. team, possibly 94 around that. Um, I, I think hopefully if health is there, the team Got 86 wins, basically hobbling, uh, getting there to the wild card spot. So I would think with Brendan Lau healthy, Wonder Franco healthy, and maybe some young guys like a Jonathan Aranda, Isaac Paredes, or Josh Lowe, really kicking it up. Even Taylor Walls. Taylor Walls had a heck of a game in, in, in there in the, in the second game. Um, if you're seeing some improvement from these guys, then you can go from 86, hopefully, to 93. That's, that's where I got them, but... Uh, you know, it's still early. <laughs> yeah. And and I kind of split the difference with Ulysses between what the Rays did in 2022 and what his expectations were going into the 2023 season. I was thinking, you know, 88, 89 wins, something along those lines. I sort of drank the Kool-Aid in the sense of the Rays didn't go out and get that veteran lefty bat, that big slugger, if you will. Where's the offense going to come from? Additionally, it concerned me and still does concern me to a point of um, the ability of the pitching staff to stay healthy. Look at Tyler Glasnow's track record. Um, look at Zach Eflin's track record. Look at Jeffrey Springs and Drew Rasmussen, you know, becoming full-time starters and working 130, 140 innings, something that they just weren't used to ever. So um, that was a big... Uh, component for myself as well. In addition to, 
I don't know how much of a difference it makes, but over the course of a long drawn out season, um, the travel, the race travel, um, you know, 40,000 miles over the course of this year, just based on where they're located and, um, and spreading out, um, the competition a little bit, you're, you're going all over the place. So that can wear down a team too. And I just wasn't so sold or sure yet if those rookies or those young players, uh, were going to step up, like what, it, what, what were we going to see from Vidal Brujan and, and Luke Rayleigh and, and Josh Lowe and Jonathan Aranda and, um, the guys that are on the big league uh, roster right now are, are certainly proving me wrong there. But I just saw so many, so many different question marks. And maybe I um, also kind of bypassed how easy of a schedule the Rays had for the first several weeks. So they are absolutely uh, shocking me in a good way right now. And hopefully they're able to keep it up. But again, it is a extremely, extremely long season. I'm right. sure by the time we get to October, the Rays will probably have a four or five, six game losing streak or multiple uh, lengthy losing streaks mixed in there. Well, it's funny because, you know, most of the time going one and three in a series, you're not necessarily that happy, but kind of where the Reds are now and where I want them to be at the end of the season, this is fine. I mean, cool. they were handed a very tough slate here in the month of April. They are just finishing up with the Rays. Uh, we were on the road facing the Braves and the Phillies, and then they came home to face the Phillies for four more, and then the Rays for three. And it's just like this team that still is yet to have its final form of its roster this year because Ellie De La Cruz is going to be on this roster at some point. Uh, Matt McClain is going to be on this roster at some point. Maybe – uh, later on this year, might we see Christian Encarnacion Strand? We're going to see a couple of rookie pitchers. You saw Levi Stout on Wednesday. Unfortunately, I was hoping for a, be a better debut than that, but you know he's he made his debut. Uh, Brandon Williamson is a starter that's going to make his debut. That th those are the two guys that they got from Seattle. Um, they've got some guys like Ellie De La Cruz and and Matt McLean who they either drafted or signed from the international pool and have always trained up through their system. So this is kind of the year where I think that they're going to take a step. The win loss total might not necessarily be, you know, inspiring, but I know that they're not going to lose a hundred games and they're probably going to approach like 73 ish, 75 ish wins simply because they're able to compete in every single one of their games. They've got a very nice core that they're building into. And they really do need that guy in the middle of the order that just strikes fear in the opposing pitcher. They've got India that's going to grind out at bats. They've got TJ Friedel that's just going to be a, a, a gritty guy that's he's going to be a tough out. But they don't really have that guy that you're worried about him hitting the ball out of the ballpark. So can they develop that? How does the pitching develop? Because outside of the big three, as you guys saw with Levi Stout coming into this one, um, outside of the big three, they, they've got a lot to figure out because Connor Overton and Luis Sessa have not, they've proven that they're not it. Uh, Luke Weaver is going to start the series against the pirates tomorrow. I think he can help out a little bit, but he wasn't it for Kansas city and he wasn't it for Arizona. So I don't know why he's it for anyone. Um, and, and, and overall, like what, what is the bullpen going to be? Because the bullpen has been taxed upon taxed upon taxed over this last week or so. And if we're going to burn out the bullpen before June, there's still a lot of baseball left. So I'm, I'm a little bit worried about how that all kind of moves through, but there's going to be so many different guys that get their chance in the major leagues that while the reds are not like the Rays and that they're competing for the top of the division, they're going to be fighting for that playoff spot. I think that they're a year or so away. They're maybe a year away from fighting for a wild card spot, maybe two years away from fighting for the division. And how do they take that step forward? Because they're starting to get that investment from ownership, which is something that reds fans were like, you know what? I'll believe it when I see it, we're seeing it. Exactly. Yeah. No, that Hunter Green extension that that that's pretty cool. Six for fifty three. So th mm -hmm. that that guarantees him. Uh, you know, he gets his bag, and the team gets you know a lot of flexible um, flexibility for for the payroll for the next uh, few years to to add on. So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, we all know about extensions, especially friendly ones. If you're yeah. a Tampa Bay Rays fan, uh, the the Rays did sign three guys: Jeffrey Springs, of course. He unfortunately going down with Tommy John. Yandy Diaz and Pete Fairbanks, who, by the way, I know I'm going to get a lot of flack for this from Locked on Race fandom and Rays Nation, uh, but I'm just trying to be as unbiased as possible. 
Pete Fairbanks did have a few fastballs get away from him about that. to the hitters, right? Yeah. Now, Pete Fairbanks, they actually call him now Pete Rarebanks because he hasn't been used that often because he's the clo- <laughs> ergo closer. But the guys are calling him in the clubhouse Rarebanks because they never see him right. because they're always having these huge leads and he's not really pitching. So I just want to give that to the Cincinnati Reds fandom. This guy is just not being used because the Rays are just winning by, by such large leads. Sure. However, it must not be fun to get 96 in the face. Uh, <laughs> that I wouldn't, I, you could not pay me enough money to, to face 96 three inches from my nose. Okay. I really like my nose, even though it might yeah. not be the best one. <laughs> I really am attached to it. So I can see why, if you're on the red side, you kind of, you know, got upset. And I know Bell, you know, got tossed. So it just, I want to get Ray's nation. Like, look, if that was against, our players, if Yandy Diaz is getting, you know, fastballs, down, you know, to his face or Wander Franco, we would also be kind of upset. So I just wanted to put it out there and, and get your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I I had wondered about it a little bit, but I mean, Rare Banks, that, that's a good one. Um, I, it makes sense to me, especially with the last couple of games for the Reds. I mean, the way that they ended the series with the Phillies was two back to back blowouts. And then this entire series was blowouts. Alexis Diaz got into the second game, but Alexis Diaz hasn't been needed either. So whenever he pitches, it's just like, oh, yeah, by the way, we have this really awesome (laughs) relief pitcher that we just haven't had the chance to use because you don't want to throw him in situations like that because maybe you will need him tomorrow when you're Mm -hmm. up by one or something. So, no, I I totally get that. And, And when I saw those pitches, I didn't think, I saw nothing during right. this series to lead me to believe that there was any th- malicious content behind it. I know that there were some yeah. on Red's Twitter that tried to push that narrative, but that yeah. I was just like, no, there's, I mean, come on. They're, they yeah, won the- both games by like 17 runs. Like why would yeah. there be malicious content from the Rays and no Reds pitchers thrown at anybody? So it's not like they're retaliating. Here, yeah, exactly. that makes no sense at all. It's not like the, the Reds, the last two nights or last two games, were pounding it on to the to the Rays or anything like that. And and the other thing too is um, this could be kind of uh, you know stoke the fire, if you will, for the Reds and you know an injection from David Bell. It, it might again light a fire under the team and, and enhance the intensity. Like all right, let's get going. Like I I let's let's get serious now. And and this could be maybe a, a turning point in some respect to um to kind of fill the room with some some passion to to go forward like we're not going to get taken advantage of just like the rays did in in 2008 i think it was in spring training where you know the yankees were you know being overly aggressive in some sense or you know coco chris being overly aggressive in 2008 um you know where the the red the the rays rather they were like hey we're not going to be bullied anymore and you know whether it's purposeful or, or kind of manufactured the the reds can kind of say that if we're not going to be bullied by anybody you know no oh, yeah and I, I i think too i could see that being in the mindset of david bell because the rest of this month they play the pirates for four i think there's a three game series against the a's to wrap it all up and they play the rangers in between that so obviously the rangers are playing pretty good right now mm-hmm. but there's a chance that they could win four or five or six more games this month and really have a nice record at the end of April last year, obviously record worst start in the history of baseball. Yeah. So for a team that is trying to sell to its fan base that we're getting better, we're taking steps to try and create a winning franchise here. You can at least have that boilerplate material and say, look at this. We went from three wins last year in the month of April to double digit wins. That's a huge improvement. So yeah, there might be a little bit of a little bit of something, something for David Bell there behind the scenes, but um, hopeful, hopeful that the Reds move forward. Cause coming from a Rays series that folks were looking at the win loss record, like good Lord, 14 and two, mm-hmm. here we go. What is this three game series going to be like? to now facing the Pirates, who, yes, have had a hot start, but if you really put the talent together with the Reds, it's apples to apples, and I think that this should be a series that the the Reds should be looking to win, then David Bell probably had a little bit of extra motivation behind his his ninth inning, let's go yell at the umpire yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 100%. Well, I tell you what, guys, this has been a lot of fun, and, and hopefully – 
obviously with the schedule being a little bit more balanced, we'll be able to talk about some Reds and Rays baseball moving forward at least once a year or something like that. But uh, maybe, who knows? World Series down the way. I don't know. <laughs> Put it down in the calendar. I'm <laughs> down. Uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be. Hey, and of... I've got I've got nothing but love for Cincinnati. My sister lives in Mount Lookout, so oh, nice. I visit there once or twice a year. So a little shout out there. Definitely a good area. Good. Uh, oh, yeah. Never mind. I was gonna say about a restaurant, and then I totally forgot the name of it. There's so a lot of good ones there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, thanks, everybody, for checking out our crossover here today. Before we go, make sure that you remember that you can check out every Rays game and Reds game on SiriusXM. Just download the SXM app and search Rays or Reds. And I know that as the Rays move along, uh, Ulysses and Kevin are going to have you covered each and every day on Lockdown Rays. And Steve, who is not with me today, but he will be back tomorrow for our live show, uh, will be with me each and every day to cover the Reds as we move along because we are all a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. We are your team every day and shout out to our everydayers who checked out today's episode.